Coming up next on News Depth, Biden embraces a proposal to shut down the U.S.-Mexico border. Erosion is driving people out of their homes in California. It's Black History Month. Let's check out a pop-up museum in Seattle and a No Ohio about inspiring black women from our state. News Depth is now. A proposed bill could give Homeland Security the authority to shut down the southern U.S. border if daily migrant crossings surpass 5,000 people. Hello, I'm Gabriel Kramer. Thank you for joining us. Last week, a bipartisan group of senators proposed a bill to overhaul immigration policies and tighten border security. President Joe Biden championed the proposal, but it faces steep opposition from some Republicans. John Sullivan explains what's in this immigration proposal and why it faces challenges. The city of Denver is overwhelmed by migrants, families housed in hotels, some living on the streets, others doing whatever they can just to make some money. We're not comfortable having a city where we have moms and kids sleeping on the streets in tents. Denver is one of many established sanctuary cities across the country, providing a safe haven for migrants. But without additional federal resources, finding ways to support them is becoming more difficult. We don't want people on the streets, but without resources, we don't have a choice. It's a struggle many of these sanctuary cities face as more migrants arrive at the U.S.-Mexico border every day. On Monday alone, U.S border authorities say they encountered around 4,800 migrants trying to enter the U.S. there. Some senators have proposed a bill that would give the Department of Homeland Security the authority to shut the border if migrant crossings rise above 5,000 per day within a given week, or 8,500 in a single day. The bill would also allow immigration services to decide asylum cases at the border. The reforms in this bill are essential for making our border more orderly, more humane and more secure. Passing the legislation may prove difficult as many Republicans worry it doesn't go far enough. Thank you, Jen. In more international affairs news, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Israel to discuss with their leaders a possible humanitarian pause in the Israel-Hamas war. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected an offer from Hamas for a hostage deal and ceasefire in Gaza. Ceasefire is a temporary break from fighting, usually to allow for peace talks to take place. Michael Yoshida has the story. As the conflict in Gaza wages on, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Israel Wednesday, pressing leaders for a humanitarian pause in the Israel-Hamas war. Blinken's visit happening as Hamas has presented a counteroffer and a stop in fighting. While there are some clear non-starters in Hamas's response, uh, we do think it creates space for agreement to be reached. The Hamas plan has three 45-day-long phases. It includes a massive humanitarian effort, the ability for Palestinians to move freely throughout Gaza, and the withdrawal of Israeli troops. Surrendering to the Hamas unbelievable demands will only ask for another disaster. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been adamant that the war will not end until there is, quote, complete victory over Hamas. Israel's offensive in Gaza, which was launched after the deadly Hamas attack on Israel exactly four months ago, has led to a humanitarian crisis as food, water, shelter and medicine shortages increase. Satellite images showing a previously open area in Rafah now filled with a makeshift tent city, estimated to hold more than a million displaced citizens. Thank you, Michael. Back in the U.S., record-breaking storms hit California last week. There was widespread damage to properties and thousands of people were without power. We now turn it to Mike Valerio with the latest after a state of emergency was declared. This is Los Angeles on Tuesday. Raging rivers swollen by flooding. Around 30 million people are under threat of flooding in Southern California, Arizona, and Nevada. Now the ground is oversaturated and giving way. L.A. fire officials report more than 300 mudslides so far. Some motorists recording huge mounds of debris flowing on a major highways. Other roads are submerged, like here in the San Fernando Valley, where one man waved down rescuers from the top of his car. And harrowing moments for a man who jumped into the fast-moving Los Angeles River to save his dog on Monday. First responders used a helicopter to lower down a rescuer. Fire officials say both man and dog were pulled out safely and are doing okay. 
The storm system also brought snow and strong winds to the Sierra Nevada mountains, causing chaos for many travelers and property owners. This is our sack feed barn, which actually flipped from the wind over our fence and took out the business's boats next to us. Officials in Butte County, north of Sacramento, have issued an emergency proclamation to bring in more resources as they and most of the state face a long cleanup ahead. Thank you, Mike. The steady rainfall has also driven dozens of Californians out of their homes due to erosion. Erosion is the gradual destruction due to wind, water, or other natural agents. Residents of the Isla Vista coastline have noticed the erosion on their properties for several years now, but the recent waves have them worried. John Palminteri reports. A shocking sight on the already unstable Isla Vista coastline has raised concerns again. After a night of steady rain that followed a stronger weekend atmospheric river, the bluff and supports on one balcony gave away. I woke up and they had us evacuated. This is about 40 feet above the beach, and at high tide, it's all water down below. The Isla Vista coastline is known for its history of erosion, and some buildings have been cut back to keep residents safe. I'm not like worried about it because like where we're sleeping at, we just wake up. It would be the deck, not like our rooms and stuff. But yeah, it's like a, it's been a precaution. Like it's in our lease and stuff that this could happen. A building inspector says he saw something similar at the edge of a structure five years ago. In 2019, about this time of year, had big rains, land gets soft. Um, that, that was pretty unusual. That reshaped uh, much of the bluff policy. This may be the most obvious area of erosion right now from this storm, but many of the residents say there are several other locations that could be just as vulnerable. A nearby resident has been keeping an eye on several properties that continuously fall apart and into the ocean. Pretty much bound to happen, knowing that I surf out in front of those houses all the time, and you can see the erosion of where the houses and the property line once was, like 15, 20 years ago. So, you know, it's bound to happen. It's inevitable. It's going to happen no matter what. That's your target. The area was personally inspected by County Supervisor Laura Capps, who heard about the slide during the weekly meeting. There's still risk of bluffs caving like we just had this morning, of trees falling down. So stay vigilant for the next few days. Don't necessarily go to the edge. One resident said the waves this time around were huge and very explosive against the properties. I like hear this like big like thunder noise or whatever, and then this huge wave just comes up over the patio, and I just look up and I'm just like, well. For those living a couple of buildings away, this was unsettling. As terrible as it might be for them, I'm also thankful it wasn't any other decks as well. And these neighbors are going to be watching the broken bluffs very closely in the days ahead. Thank you, John. Erosion doesn't just happen on the shores of an ocean, it is also happening on lakes. Take Lake Erie, for example. It's been affected by weathering, erosion, and deposition. Margaret Cavalier heads to Lake Erie to explain the difference between these three environmental impacts. In the summer, I like to head to the shores of Lake Erie. No, not for a dip in the water, for a walk along the beach and a hunt for sea glass. Unfortunately, I haven't had much luck. I'm more likely to leave with some smooth pebbles than a pretty piece of glass. But still, Lake Erie is a great spot to learn about weathering, erosion, and deposition. Let's start with weathering. That's the breaking down of rocks, soils, and other substances into smaller pieces, especially by wind and water. So those pebbles I found, they probably weren't always so small or so smooth. Being knocked around by the water and pushed by waves into one another resulted in their rough edges being smoothed away. Voila, weathering. Zoom out from the pebbles and we can see erosion in action. Erosion is a process of moving rocks and soil to a new location. As waves from Lake Erie hit the shore, they start to knock down soft soil and pull it away from its original place. Erosion is a particularly dangerous process for folks whose homes are located on the shore. Gravity is happy to lend a hand, and as the soil gets pulled away by the water, large chunks of the shoreline can tumble right into the lake. To keep this from happening, some communities along Lake Erie have installed what are called break walls or breakwaters. Those are usually large piles of rock that are not as easy for the lake to erode. Of course, all of Lake Erie is an example of erosion. During the Ice Age, the glacier that covered Ohio scooped right through the area, leaving the lake behind. You can see good evidence of it over on Kelly's Island.
check out these grooves left behind. Erosion is a pretty destructive process. Now where there's erosion, somewhere else there has to be deposition. That is when the soil, rocks, and minerals that were eroded are dropped off, creating new landforms. It's a constructive process. So the sand on the beach is a great example. It was brought to shore by the water, making a beach and some dunes. Lots of other areas of Ohio have rich soil good for farming because it was deposited there by Ice Age glaciers. All three of these processes, weathering, erosion, and deposition, continuously tear down and build up Earth's surface. But enough with the lessons. I want to see if I can find some of that beach glass. Thank you, Margaret. Now for our writing question this week, we want to know, have you noticed weathering, erosion, or deposition in your neighborhood? We also want to know your theory as to why that's happening. And if you send us a picture of your evidence, we might be able to share it on the next episode. Remember, you can always send in your answers using our inbox form online. Last week, we asked you how old you think people should be to be on social media. Let's check out the results of the poll. 37% of you think you should be at least 10 years old to be on social media. About 28% of you think 12 years old is old enough to be online. Another 24% of you think 15 years old is an appropriate age. And 11% of you said eight years old or even younger is okay. We also asked you to tell us why you picked that age group. Let's see what you had to say by opening our inbox. Emily from Minster Schools in Minster starts us off with Dear News Depth. I think kids should be allowed on social media at the age of 12 years old. I think this because at 12, you are more mature and responsible. So that's why 12 is when you should get a phone and maybe 12 or 13 years old to get social media. I like replying to your questions, so I hope I can get on. A watcher, Emily. Great point, Emily, and we thank you for watching. Braylon from Bellevue Elementary in Bellevue thinks kids should be safe while using social media. Dear News Depth, I think kids should be at least 13 years or older to be posting content. But if someone is getting on social media to watch videos and gain information, depending on how old they are, they might need safety mode or parental controls. Addie from Hilltop Elementary in Canfield can see a need for kids to be online. Dear News Depth, I think that eight and younger should be on social media because for school, they need their Chromebooks and if they search up something inappropriate, then their admin will block it. At home, it should be 13 plus because younger kids may see violent games and videos, but if it's a kid from the game or video, like your videos, they should play it. P.S. Tell Newshound that he's my favorite part of the video and give him belly rubs. Watching kid-friendly videos like News Death is a great reason to be online. Nathan from McCormick Middle School in Wellington thinks kids need to be mature when using social media. Somebody should be 15 or older to be on social media because they have to share personal information, so the site they are using could track them. And Lily from Whitney Elementary in Strongsville believes in taking a break from screens. Dear News Depth, I think that only kids 15 or older can be on social media because younger kids will be playing video games all day long, which is really bad for your brain and your eyes. That is why I think only kids 15 or older should be on social media. P.S. Give Newshound lots of head rubs. Thanks for writing in everyone. And I noticed a lot of you really love Newshound. Even I got a shout out from Parker in Beaver Creek. Well, guess what, Parker? I think you're really cool too. We really enjoy reading how much you like News Depth and Newshound, but I think it's getting to Newshound's head a little bit. I think he's turning into a bit of a diva. Okay, let's see if he managed to get some work done this week. It's time for the petting zoo. Hey, Newshound. What, what is happening right now? You're just eating treats. Are you, are you drinking milk out of a fancy glass? Okay, Newshound, you still have work to do, remember? What did you find this week? Oh, a story about five manatees rescued and released at Blue Spring State Park in Florida. This is one of those opportunities that we all love because we get the opportunity to see the animals that were rescued get returned back to the wild. The first manatee, Lizzie, weighed nearly a thousand pounds. She was rescued in 2020 and was rehabbed at SeaWorld and Columbus Zoo. Her friend on the side, Mary Kate, was also rescued two years ago. While the water may be cold for us humans, 72 degrees is just about perfect for manatees here at Blue Spring State Park. To check out what the volunteers that saved them had to say, click the petting zoo thumbnail at the bottom of this episode page.
Thank you, news hound. You see, I told you all of his fame is getting to his head. All right, let's get back to the news. Black history is a major part of American history, and in February, we celebrate Black History Month. Black History Month is a special time when we celebrate and honor the accomplishments and contributions of black people throughout history. It's a time to learn about the struggles they faced, the achievements they made, and the important roles they played in shaping our world. One of the darkest chapters in American history was the transatlantic slave trade. The effects of slavery can be seen even to this day. But the city of Boston has put together teams that will examine the city's slave history and consider recommendations for reparations. Reparations are compensations as an amends to a wrong. Massachusetts is not the only state to put together a reparations task force. Last summer, California became the first state in the country to assign a committee. The Boston Reparations Task Force will research and document the city's role in historical ties to the transatlantic slave trade and the institution and legacies of slavery. Rondella Richardson reports. Boston proudly celebrates black history, refurbishing this monument to the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. 1638 marked the arrival of slave ships, the Desire Ship in Boston Harbor. This museum print illustrates the indignity and the gruesomeness. What was the city of Boston's role in the triangle slave trade, in the uh, profiteering, the benefits, and how do those structures still show up today? Individuals, corporations, government benefited off the backs of enslaved people. And that's what the historical examination we have to start there. Parts of the American dream still elusive to many of those living the black experience. We had governmental policies, the denial of the VA loans, the, the denials of, of the FHA loans, uh, all of the things where uh, whites particularly were able to advance. A majority of blacks missed the real estate boom and an opportunity for intergenerational wealth. We talked about uh, black, black people were promised 40 acres and a mule which they never received. In today's world, what is payback? Um, payback is probably just at least being able to speak about the injustices that we face. Whether people who are descendants of slaves are paid or not, how do you want people to feel after this deep dive by the task force? We are a city that's known for our history, and when Boston takes action, that can shape how cities around the country understand their possibilities. Thank you, Rondella. In Seattle, Washington, a pop-up museum is bringing focus to the city's vibrant black history. Sharon Yu gives us a sneak peek at what the museum's exhibits are all about. A good story often has a show and tell. Um, come on in. And for Tony Benton, the founder of Seattle's Black History Pop-Up Museum, February is the perfect opportunity to share what he knows. A lot of our history is in attics, treasure chests, back rooms. When these elders pass away, it's thrown away because there is no recognized uh, infrastructure to keep this history. The latest U.S. Census shows that the black population here in Seattle stands at around 4.5 percent. And Benton says while it's not a hub here, the black history is unique to our area. We're not Atlanta. We're not Chicago. We're not New York. The way that we dealt with repression and oppression and overcame the obstacles is unique to this city and unique to these individuals. And that history isn't really recorded anywhere. And it adds context to why we are, who we are, and where we are today. An exhibit about Seattle's Black Panther Party at the museum highlights its fight for civil rights and the important work it did for the community. Free breakfast program, that was started by the Seattle Black Panther Party. That is now a national institution, you know? And so uh, making people aware of, of what we've done, you know, it instills pride. Ever heard of the Seattle Steelheads? For two years, our city had a team in the West Coast Negro Baseball League. From treasure chests and into the spotlight, Benton says he hopes the collection will show black Seattle history is our Seattle history. You see yourself in this museum, you see your neighbors in this museum, and you see the contributions of African Americans to Seattle National. What a great story. Thank you, Sharon. Now, Ohio has been home to plenty of inspiring African American ladies who lead the way in their industries. Mary brings us this week's Know Ohio to share the accomplishments of public figures like Hallie Quinn Brown, 
Ohio Supreme Court Justice Yvette McGee Brown and Academy Award winning actress Halle Berry. Take it away, Mary. Historically, women have had to overcome hurdles to gain power and become leaders. And today we're talking about some famous females who had to overcome a set of extra hurdles because of their race. These African-American women showed some major courage, overcame adversity, and inspired change. First up, Hallie Quinn Brown. She was born in Pittsburgh in 1850 to parents who were former slaves. Hallie attended college at the historically black Wilberforce University in Ohio. With her diploma, Brown headed south to begin her career as a teacher. She led classes for children from families working on plantations in South Carolina and Mississippi. But eventually she returned north to teach in Dayton and take up a role as an elocution professor at her alma mater, Wilberforce. Elocution is the skill of giving effective speeches and boy was Brown good at it. It was said her humorous speeches brought on waves of laughter and her serious ones brought people to tears. She even gave speeches before the Queen of England. She was widely known for giving speeches about African Americans' lives and the challenges they faced. Brown especially advocated for women. She was a founding member of the National Association for Colored Women's Clubs in 1893 and later served as its president in the 1920s. She also worked for President Calvin Coolidge's election campaign, focusing specifically on black women's issues. Next, let's learn about Yvette McGee Brown. She was born in Columbus in 1960 and graduated from Ohio State University's law program in 1985. Yvette became the first African-American woman elected to the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas. During her time there, she created a program that changed how police, hospitals, and other groups respond to children and families who have experienced abuse. It's almost like human services work, using the power of the court to get change. She later became the first African-American woman appointed to the Ohio Supreme Court in 2010. Even that wasn't enough for her. She returned to practicing law in Columbus and became partner in charge of diversity, inclusion, and advancement for Jones Day, an international law firm. Finally, let's talk about another famous Hallie from Ohio, actress Halle Berry. She was born in Cleveland in 1966. Her parents got her name from the old Hallie's department store in the downtown area. Berry said she experienced discrimination during high school because most of her peers were white but she took part in lots of extracurricular activities and eventually attended college at Cuyahoga Community College. She left college to pursue modeling and acting. Barry acted in several TV shows in the 1990s before getting her big break in the Spike Lee film, Jungle Fever. In 2001, she became the first African-American woman to win the Academy Award for Best Actress. Halle Berry in Monsters Bay. Barry's list of movie credits just keeps getting longer and longer. She even earned a star on the Walk of Fame in 2007. Talk about superstars. These black women from all different times in Ohio history show us how determination to succeed can help you to rise to the top. Those women are superstars. For our poll this week, we want to know which of these three women do you find most inspiring? Jump over to our poll page to vote. You can choose between Halle Quinn Brown, Yvette McGee Brown, or Halle Berry. And come back next week to see how your favorite ranks among your peers. Well, it's almost time to wrap up the show, but we can't forget one of the best parts of News Depth, hearing what amazing things you all do. It's time for the a Award. Recently, we got a letter from Gemma, a fifth grader at Gillis Sweet Elementary School in Fairview Park. She told us all about the great work the student council has done over the past year or so, and we decided we need to get out there and meet her. Our conversation with Gemma convinced us that this week's a Award was going to the student council at Gillis Sweet. Her teacher, Mrs. Rushnock, who was a huge NewsHound fan, told us this was the best decision we made all year. Gemma explained to us that the students have to get nominated to serve on the student council by a teacher. Teachers will consider how kind a student is, if they're responsible, and how well they do in class. She also explained that the student council is organized into two different groups. One meets in the fall and the other meets in the spring. They do it this way so all the students get a chance to participate in the activities. 
Gemma told us that one of her favorite activities is working with the residents of O'Neill's Healthcare. O'Neill's is a senior living community located near the school. The student council visits the facility and gives them homemade ornaments and they drink hot chocolate together. Gemma told us that it's really rewarding to see all the smiles on people's faces when they're there. The visits to O'Neill's are so popular that there's even a wait list for students to participate. That's not all though. Gemma told us that the student council also runs a food drive every year and they donate the food they collect to the Fairview Hunger Center. They even have a turkey trot race to kick off the event. Gemma finished sixth in this year's race, even though she was recovering from a recent surgery. That's one fast turkey. Gemma told us that she's learned a lot in student council. She wants all of you to know that it's a lot of fun to be involved in a community, and as a bonus, it's really rewarding. She told us that when you give back and make people smile, it's one of the best feelings you can have. This week's A Plus award goes to Gemma and the Gillis Suite Student Council. Congratulations. Okay, now we are out of time for this week's show, but you know we always want to hear from you and there are plenty of ways you can stay in touch with us. You can write to us, we're at 1375 Euclid Avenue, Cleveland, Ohio. Our zip code here is 44115. Or you can email us at newsdepth at ideastream.org. Plus, you can catch all of our special segments on YouTube. Hit subscribe if you're old enough so you don't miss out on any of our new videos. Thank you for joining us, I'm Gabriel Kramer, and we'll see you right back here next week. New Steps is made possible by a grant from the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation.